Hey, good morning. Carry on. Have a seat, please. Hey, thanks for coming. It's great to see such a good turnout. There's uh, there's more seats up in the front row. Hey, it's uh, great to be here. We've got a large team here for you at uh, our sixth Career Development Symposium. And uh, the theme this year is Take Charge of Your Career. And it really speaks to what we're doing uh, with Sailor 2025 and, and all the programs we've been rolling out. Uh, and our goal during the symposium, as I said, uh, is really to be here and help you uh, navigate your career through really uh, a tumultuous period of change. You know, we've been turning the personnel system upside down, inside out, and for good reason. It's, it's been long overdue uh, for change. A lot of things that, um, uh, you know, have been uh, uh, working okay, but we've been living with a lot of problems. We've been living with a lot of things that were good enough and uh, just weren't really serving us as well as they could have been. And we've been fixing it, we've been working really hard. And you've just been seeing kind of the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, what's to come. And we want to tell you about not just what we've done and why we've done it and what that means, uh, because I think in some cases there's a little bit of maybe misunderstanding out there. So we want to talk about that and answer your questions, allay any concerns. But we also want to tell you about the big picture about where we're going and, and why and, and what that means. Uh, so 2018 was, uh, like I said, kind of the beginning of the rollout of things. In 2019, you're going to see that pace of rollout really kind of uh, accelerate. And that, and that pace will continue to accelerate. Because what we've really been doing since 2015 when we started the, the, the Sailor 2025 effort was really the foundation when we started to break down the policies lay the foundation for uh, a new infrastructure for uh, the technology that's going to run a personnel system going forward. So I encourage you to make the use, uh, the, the best use of the symposium. Uh, we've got uh, uh, a large number of detailers here, the community managers. They're going to be over in the uh, Career Information uh, Center. Uh, uh, we'll be uh, rating pack sailors. We'll be negotiating orders. You can talk to a human being instead of a CMS ID. Uh, you can um, uh, go learn about education programs. You can uh, do all sorts of things. Uh, go learn firsthand. Talk to those folks. They're, they're experts in what they do. And throughout the day, um, you know, this morning's briefs, ask questions. That's what we're here for. We're here to uh, find out what's on your mind, answer your questions, let you know what's going on. I think uh, you've already heard about the, the tool that we got going on. You can use your smartphones, your iPads, whatever, just pull everywhere a uh, tool. Um, we're going to use that to gather feedback. We'll capture questions that you know maybe you don't want to raise your hand and talk about. We're going to have a stand-up uh, session uh, at the end of the briefings uh, later in the morning. We'll, we'll capture some of those questions and talk about those uh, later in the morning. And anything we don't get to during the uh, stand-up session, we'll write up the answers and get those back to you. Um, you know, within a week or so afterwards. So he will answer all of your questions. Uh, but I've got Admiral Hughes, Commander of Navy Personnel Command here, uh, the head detailer, uh, Admiral uh, Giesman, uh, Dick Pond Smith is here, um, Fleet uh, Koshopper, uh, the whole team's here. So fit rapid eval changes, rating modernization, um, uh, the advancement, uh, uh, advanced the vacancy stuff that we're doing, the board, changes, you know, you name it, ask us questions on it. And then uh, later this morning, after I get done talking, uh, right away, I've got a, a special uh, guest, uh, a very good friend of the Navy, uh, Mr. Uh, Chris Gardner, uh, is here to speak. And uh, he's a sailor, uh, once a sailor, always a sailor. He's got a really good message, and uh, he uh, agreed to come and talk with us this morning. He doesn't make it, uh, to every one of our career development symposium, but he uh, likes to come when he can make it, and uh, he, he agreed to come this morning, so uh, we're very lucky to have him this morning. Before I get into kind of what's going on in the personnel world, though, I wanted to take just a moment to uh, kind of pull up to a higher altitude 
big picture in the Navy. Um, I feel very lucky to be the Chief of Naval Personnel because I, I really truly believe that, you know, you hear this all the time, and I read all the time that uh, sailors think, uh, you know, it's a platitude, uh, you know, we're just kind of talking uh, out of one side of our mouth and not really meeting it. But I really truly do believe that sailors are our most important asset. And I also believe right now that the Navy has a leadership team that is putting uh, the Navy's money towards that. Uh, over the last, really since we started the Sailor 2025 effort, 2015, 2016, we have been trying to make good on that saying uh, and really show that uh, we value sailors as that number one asset. Um, the other kind of saying is, you know, the only weapon system with a heart. And if you really go back throughout history, uh, you know, regardless of where we were with technology, whether it was the Revolutionary War, World War II, or, you know, even with today's technology, it's always been the ingenuity of our sailors that allowed us to prevail in battle. And I'm convinced that's the way it's going to be in the future. So we owe it to you to give you the best training, the best education, the best equipment. We owe it to you to arm you to be able to think, to be able to innovate, to be able to do the things that we know you're going to need to be able to do uh, on the battlefield. And in order to do that, we also need to pull all these distractions away from you. And that's what we're doing with Sailor 2025, is the distractions of, you know, your pay not being right after you do a PCS move, the distractions of having to keep your social security number 1,400 times whenever you're filling out, you know, travel claims, because we know that. We, we know your social security number. Why do we have to ask for it all those times? Um, you know, making you uh, do, uh, you know, 1940s, uh, level of admin um, when the rest of the world is, is working uh, in 21st century technology. So we owe you better than that, and that's why we're working on this stuff. PCS uh, moved money, running out of money every year up until the last couple of years. It's embarrassing. We owe you better than that. So this leadership team, and I'm talking about really our current Secretary of the Navy, CNO, Vice Chief, um, they've been really receptive to these programs and we've put a lot of fixes in place that are going to outlast all of us. And it's going to be right from this point going forward. And I want you to take that home from today. And I'll show you some data on that a little bit later. But that's going to be really important because of this kind of environment that we're in. And you know, you've, you've been hearing a lot, reading a lot in the papers about this great powers competition that we're in. And you know, what does that really mean? What does that great powers competition mean? Well, simply put, you know, while our nation was preoccupied with two land wars for the better part of the last 20 years, um, we were kind of continuing to improve all of our capabilities, but at what I would call an incremental pace. You know, we we're getting you know better, but at a linear rate. Our Adversaries in the maritime domain are near peers, folks like Russia, China. Those guys were getting better at a whole lot faster pace because they didn't have to play by the same rules as us. You know, they were borrowing, they were in some cases maybe even stealing, but they didn't have to play by the same rules, the same laws, the same set of ethics that we might apply to ourselves. They were moving exponentially. And today, they're a whole lot closer to us than we would like. Maybe in some areas, they might be better than us. And if you really kind of look around at some of those near peers, we're in a situation that's not a whole lot different than it was in the years just prior to World War II, where if we were in a, a large maritime battle on the high seas, a blue water navy battle, you know, the outcome might not be certain that we would win, you know, if we had to go fight tonight. And I'm not trying to predict doom and gloom here. I'm confident we're going to win, but we're going to probably get our nose bloody a little bit and we'll 
themselves and that should concern us. And, and here in the Pacific Fleet AOR, you guys know better than me that we're very concerned about China. And uh, they're continuing efforts to expand their, their reach and their influence, uh, their, their view of an international order and their playbook for how to do that and, and what their view of that international order should be. They kind of have this, this facade of what they're offering, but other nations now are sort of starting to see through that facade and are gaining the same opinion of that playbook that we have and start to work against China a little bit. So the number of nations with uh, the reaction to China that we have is, is growing. But specifically, a concern to us is that China sees the United States and in particular the United States Navy as the only obstacle to it achieving its national objectives. So they're working very hard to catch up to the United States Navy. They're working very hard to come out and meet the United States Navy and measure up to us or to test us or to challenge us and see what our reaction is going to be. The same thing's going on in other theaters in the Iranian Gulf. The Iranians are doing it to us uh, at an increasing uh, rate. And the Russians are doing it in the Black Sea, in the Mediterranean, in the Baltic, in the Atlantic, in the North Sea, at an increasing pace. Because they're getting closer, they want to know what they've got. The good thing about all that is they're testing themselves relative to us, so we're the gold standard. So that's good. The bad thing is they're perceiving that they're improving relative to us, and they're coming out to see how close they're getting to us. So good, we're still the measurement standard, bad that they think they're getting close enough that they ought to come out and check. So we gotta be on our guard. Um, but I think we just have to be of the mindset that we need to be ready. One of these days when they come out to measure themselves, they're not gonna just try and make us flinch. A lot of what they've been doing lately is see if we'll flinch. One of these days they're gonna come out and do something for real. And we have to start having the mindset that, that this is gonna be real. When we get underway, when we deploy, we have to get underway or deploy like it's a wartime mission. We have to have that mindset and go like going to war. Um, we have to go and be ready to go fight hurt. When's the last time that the United States Navy fought hurt? I mean, really fought hurt. Really, it was battle they take off. 1943, it's been a while. So train hard, know your craft, really know what your shipmates have to do, make sure they know what they're doing, train each other, look out for each other. When you do your training, make sure everyone's ready to do their job and uh, be ready for that. How many people here have read the design for maintaining maritime superiority? We released version 2.0 in December, which adds some more you know, finesse on that, but what's, what's the whole point of that whole document? Just in a, in a phrase, what's it trying to say? Anyone? Please. being the strongest Navy we can be because of this environment of this great power competition and everyone else improving exponentially, we've got to start improving exponentially. But what's in the way of us improving exponentially? Well, in some cases, it's our own bureaucracy above us in a lot of cases. You know, that's the job of, you know, me, the CNO, the Secretary of the Navy, we're working that stuff. But in a lot of cases, it's ourselves. It's our own mindset. And we're in our own way. And we've got to get out of our own way to start moving the obstacles ourselves and change the way we think. And that's what I'm talking about when I say think like you're going to war every time you get underway. 
and start thinking about how you do things differently. How can we do things smarter? You guys are our best asset. You always figure out the best way to do things. Uh, you know, skippers, Commodore's fly us are telling you how to do stuff. Never gonna make any sense. You guys will figure out the best way to do it. So figure it out, run up the flagpole. If you need more money, you need more equipment. But make your case and we'll get it for you. And we'll get it approved and we'll spread it through the rest of the Navy. If it's a good enough idea, we'll do it fast. That's that's what the design is about. Sense of urgency, business as usual isn't good enough. We got to do things differently. Um, I'll, I'll kind of get off the uh, bandwagon on, on that point, but uh, just uh, think about that a, a little bit. Challenge yourself and others. Demand more than just the standard, and uh, be trained to be competent expect the same from your teammates. We'll go into the brief here a little bit, and then uh, we'll get uh, Chris Gardner on. Let's go to the first slide, please. So this is really kind of talking about where we're going at the Navy, setting the tone for what we're doing with the people programs. The graph on the upper left is really kind of talking about how we built the case for Congress to grow the Navy. And it was talking about all this great power competition. You know, we reached the absolute lowest number of ships we had in 2016. We got to 272 ships. That's the smallest United States Navy has been since just after World War I. Uh, we're at uh, 288 today and growing. By uh, the fiscal year 2023, we'll be at 326. Uh, and that's paid for in uh, last year's budget remains to be seen it will grow all the way to 355, but Congress passed a law last year that says we will have no fewer than 355 ships, so if they don't fund us to that, they'll also have to pass another law, and uh, that's getting kind of hard to do, so it'll be an interesting kind of coming in. So we think we're on a path there, and the people to man those ships have also been paid for, so we're growing. Today we're at about 325,000 active duty people in the Navy. I'm not counting the selected reservists, SELRAS, that's about another 60,000 sailors. But we're adding 20,000 sailors just to get us to the 326 ships. If we go to 355, that'll be another 20 to 25,000 sailors on top of that. That'll take us to around 375, 385,000 sailors. All right, we go to 355. So the elements of that, you know, a bigger Navy, that's more ships, everybody gets that. The better Navy is, you know, we're gonna be smart about it. We're not just gonna build more ships. We're gonna also modernize the ships that we have and put more capability on those, on those combatants that we have. We'll put those, those new capabilities on the new ones that we're building as well. But we're also gonna network those ships in, in new ways, ways that we haven't thought about networking before. And we think about networking today in terms of uh, you know, C4I, command and control, communications, intelligence. But how about uh, thinking about networking um, uh, weapons, networking sensors, even networking the platforms. So think about sensors as a service. A submarine tapping an aircraft, using the aircraft sensors to lock onto a target to use one of its own weapons, or even to use another, a different aircraft type of weapons, or any combination. They're all kind of interconnected. Uh, platforms are just another service, and they're all interconnected. Weapons are a service, sensors are a service, platforms are, are a service. That can all be netted back to any different number of uh, mechanisms. The other part of better is talent, and that's where Sailor 2025 comes in, things like ready, relevant learning that, that we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. The other piece of this is, you know, as we get ready to integrate things like uh, artificial intelligence and unmanned into our um, uh, battle force, how do we command and control that sort of stuff? And how do we you know, integrate 
uh, and train people for those skill sets to come in and control that. You know, um, do we want the uh, unmanned and the AI to be completely autonomous? Or do we want to put humans in the loop? If we have humans in the loop, it's going to be too slow. If there's no humans in the loop, well, we saw that movie, that, you know, that Skynet. That doesn't end well. I probably don't want to go there. So, so we've been working on what are the concepts there. You know, and I mean, it's humans on the loop. Uh, there's some geographic boundaries. We let it go as long as it's in this area, it does whatever it wants. I don't know, we're working that out. We've got, we know how to build people that can make AI. How do you, how do you train people that know how to use AI ethically and morally in combat? We don't even know what ethically and morally in combat means, let alone how to make people that know how to use it yet. So how do we do that? That's the kind of stuff we're working on. Um, ready? Well, the other part about better is also our tactics. If you've heard of distributed maritime ops and distributed lethality, you know, we're coming up on uh, over 100 years ago, uh, back uh, when, uh, you know, Arthur Thayer Mahan came up with this concept of concentrating our battle forces. You know, this was the late 1800s. And then when the United States Navy really started great white fleet sailing together in World War I, World War II, our, our fleets sailed together in formations. And the whole reason we did that was because our ability to target was so crappy that to get our ordnance in the same place at the same time, our ships had to be at the same place almost, so that we could get the same targets at the same time concentrate our fires. The whole idea was concentrating the fires to overwhelm the enemy. Well, we don't have to do that anymore because we've got smart ordnance, you know, GPS. We can get our ordnance to the same place uh, at the same time from all over the world now. So why would we concentrate our ships on one place and make it really easy for the enemy to target us? That's what distributed maritime ops is. Let's spread ourselves out. We can concentrate our fires. Let's make it really hard for the enemy to attack us. That really complicates a lot of other things like logistics, refueling, resupply ordnance, things like that. That's why you know, things like lasers, rail guns, and all that other stuff are going to be really important to us. So there's a whole bunch of other stuff coming that are going to be really important to, to go to that better. And then the ready, you know, uh, sequestration killed us there. You all are living that dream. Uh, Congress has been uh, throwing money to us for the last two years. Too little, too late. I don't know. Uh, it's been welcome, but we're still not out of that readiness hole. Uh, we still have 8,000 gaps at sea. You know, we've been full throttle on bringing new sessions into the Navy. The retention is through the roof at historic level, and we still have 8,000 gaps at sea today. We'll be out of those by you know, the end of next year, but as fast as we can go, you know, we're still living that in a manpower world. Same thing's true in ordnance, same thing's true in aviation maintenance, the same thing's true in shipboard maintenance because of that you know, four-year vacation on funding for the cost to operate the Navy. So readiness is going to continue to be an issue there. So that's that. If you go to the uh, next inset, when we started this journey on what we're doing on NPT and e nobody knows what that means except for people that work for me, so we're going to change that name. But that's the manpower, personnel training, and education. It's what we call our enterprise of all these disparate commands that, that do personnel and training and education. But we decided that uh, about the three years ago, that we're going to commit ourselves to customer service. What? Customer service in the military? Seriously, though, I mean, you hopefully you've seen some of this already, but we're going to get good at this, and when we're done, you should expect customer service and demand it. We will get good at this. We're at the beginning of the journey. We're not there yet, 
but we are committed to it. We're going to be a flat organization. We're going to be lean. We're going to be agile. We're going to be responsive, not just to you, but your families. We are beginning to see it take off in pockets of our organization. It's growing. We've got a long way to go. Next. We can go on the next slide, please. Um, just this to talk about the, the, the journey here. In 2016, that was probably the kind of the end of the sequestration, the last year, and when we really kind of hit the tripwire there. Uh, we had to stop PCS moves in the middle of that summer, in the middle of peak summer season. Worst possible thing. But you know, for years we had been doing this thing where um, we used portions of the manpower account. This is just really bad behavior, but I'm coming clean with you. The Navy used portions of the manpower accounts to pay other bills routinely. And when prior to sequestration, we had enough money to slide it around and, and still make PCS moves work. Once sequestration started and things got so tight, there wasn't enough money. And that's when the, the summer move crisis started around 2012. 2016, it really kind of came to a head. And that's when we kind of realized the structural issues that that caused us to have to use those manpower accounts to pay other bills. So we fixed them in 2016. And the first time, the first uh, budget we could impact in 2016 was a 2018 budget. So we fixed that. It was part us, part congressional. Um, but you notice that last year, 2018, there were no PCS delays in the summer. And there won't be in 2019 or ever again because we fixed that. But that's a thing in the past. So that's one point. The other point here is that we've been systemically raising the requirements on every platform. Everybody's kind of obsessed with this fit and fill number. And fill is an important metric. Don't get me wrong, but it's a percentage of a requirement. And we have been continuously raising the requirement, demanding a higher and higher standard of ourselves, which is a very good thing. But look at the look at the numbers. In 2012, just take the DDG example. Um, we were getting that 240th sailor on a DDG the day the DDG deployed. In 2017, we were getting the 272nd sailor on board the DDG six months before the DDG deployed, so that that 272 sailors were on board for the full deployment workup. And we were keeping 272 sailors on board for the deployment and for the whole sustainment period after the deployment so they could do a surge deployment. So that's a drastic improvement. Now, because the requirement had gone up so much, the requirement was actually in the 280s. Their fill number in FY17 was down in the 92%. So fill looked bad, but the actual number of bodies was better. Today on a DDG, we're averaging around 294. But the requirement's up around 305, 306. By next year, they're going to be in the 320s because we continue to add requirements. That's true of every class of ship. Uh, same thing with aviation squadrons, aviation maintenance in particular. Uh, we were late to the game to add aviation maintenance requirements, but those are catching up now. So a lot of good stuff going on to get you help to reduce your working hours, to help you, you know, achieve some life work balance, go get those schools, do the things you need to do in your careers. And that's really the thing I want you to take away from this slide that knuckleheads in D.C. have heard you were paying for the things that we ought to be paying for to uh, help, help uh, you balance things out. Next slide. And, and this is just another example. If you just look at our overall fleet management, this is in percentages. Again, percentage of a requirement is a little bit um, fuzzy, but if you look at that kind of yo-yo drill, that's as we play budget games in terms of what it does to the fleet manning. But FY18, FY16 is when we kind of had that crisis with the budget. As fast as we could 
you know, open the throttles and, and uh, bring in people and do things to improve retention, we still, you know, went into the descent. It's just a slow moving mechanism. And we've got permanent fixes in, so we're never going to do this back and forth again. It looks like kind of a drunk aviator flying a plane. Uh, we fired him, so he's not coming back. So we're going to do this ascent again, and you see, you know, by by the uh, uh, you know beginning of FY20, mid FY21, we're uh, whole Navy is up above the 95%. This is if I peanut butter spread people across the whole Navy, not just deployers, uh, and, and that's pretty good. We'll have deployers well above 95%. Well, they're they're there now actually, but uh, you know we'll be in the 97, 98%. So where do we go when we get the fill numbers up there? The next objective is to change the fit metric because the fit metric is not serving us well right now. Because even if a command is at 100% fit and 100% fill, you could be missing six critical NECs and not be able to deploy. So we're gonna go to an NEC-based fit so that we can stop these TMADs and cross decks, stop the insanity. We couldn't do that two years ago until we had DVD, little base distribution, but we're gonna be able to do that here uh, shortly. Next slide. This just talks about 2017, all the NAV admins that came out, higher tenure changes, um, taking EAOS to PRD, because that was generating unplanned losses. Uh, there's a bunch of laws that prevent us from writing your initial enlistment contracts to match your EAOS to your PRD. So we're never going to be able to permanently solve that, but we're going to continue to have mechanisms in place to go back and, and catch that up. But all the things that came out there in the middle of 2017 was about maximizing you know, return on investment at sea duty, incentivizing sea duty. And boy, sailors uh, took that. Uh, 2,200 man years worth of takers stay at CB. It really helped us out that under managing uh, last year. Next. And so in 2025, again, kind of a living, breathing portfolio of things that we're doing just to make uh, our career paths better. Really, three big picture objectives here. More choices, more flexibility, and I think the most important thing here is transparency. Treat sailors like adults. Show you what we got, everything, good, bad, other, and let you make choices because you, know, you can make choices like adults. And you know, things like CMS ID, Seaway, not very transparent. So we're making those go away as fast as we can. Um, Meritorious Advancement Program, perfect example of how we threw something out there not doing things the normal Washington DC way of doing business. We put it out there, we took some um, you know, calculated risk, saw how it went, and then adjusted it very quickly. And uh, we're about to release the, the next version of this. We're gonna go to two seasons. Each season is going to overlap the uh, Navy-wide advancement exam. So there's going to be absolutely no reason for a training officer or command triad to not pick somebody because they think they're going to advance on the exam. Because it doesn't matter if they advance on the exam. There's going to be two map seasons and they surround them to maybe wide advancement exam. We're going to go up to uh, about 20% of the Navy wide advancement exam opportunity uh, as meritorious. We're going to walk our way up to that carefully in a controlled manner. But uh, we'll do that over two seasons. So the first season will be 10%. We'll see how that went. And assuming that went okay, the second season will be another 10%. If there were some problems, we may go less than 10% the second season, and the rest will be on the advancement exam. So again, the entire advancement opportunity will be there. It's just a matter of how much goes on that and how much goes on the exam. Um, Detailing marketplace. We're going to show you and, and have some demos and talk a lot more about that today. But um, 
This is going to replace CMS ID. The first ratings will probably uh, see that in August of this year. But, you know, sailors will see all the jobs. We'll tell you which ones we're probably not going to fill because on average, you know, we're filling about 75% of the jobs out there. But you'll get to see them because there are some cases where those might be a discussion point. If you're willing to talk, uh, you know, multiple tours, We'll have conversations about geographic stability. If you want to stay in a location and get your kids through high school or whatever it might be. If you want to work a deal to get a grad ed program, or if you, you know, are willing to move and go to a hard job location overseas or something, uh, or a guarantee for your own education program later on, we'll work that too. So there's, you know, lots of incentives out there to be had if you're if you're willing to work. Trades, because you can see who else is on the slate. You don't have to know somebody or hear something. It's there. The information is right there. You can talk directly to the commands. They can talk to you. You can write up your own resume on the sale of resume and sell yourself to the command. Why you're the best fit for that job, as well as possible. Um, the advanced vacancy piece will be on detailing marketplace. So we piloted that with um, senior chiefs and master chiefs last year. Pretty selective. We advertised about 89 jobs. Um, we uh, only filled about uh, 30 of them, 29 or 30 of them, uh, because we were selective about who we would take uh, in that pilot. Uh, we're going to expand that to uh, E5s and E6s here in the next CMS ID slate for tough jobs like recruiters and uh, uh, recruit division. But there's incentives associated with that. So if you're an E5 and you apply and get accepted to one of those jobs, you'll get advanced to E6 if you're selected to it. It's a you know auto advance if you, get, if you take one of those jobs on the marketplace. Tailored compensation. We just announced that uh, first pilot there. So if you're a top performer and you're eligible for an SRV, you'll get a higher SRV level. So if your multiple was normally, I don't know, five or six, and you're a top performer as defined by a set of criteria, your multiple will go to maybe a 6.5 or a seven. Okay, and as our new eval system comes out, uh, we will expand that to the rest of the Navy. As we have better performance data, because right now our performance data sucks because our eval system sucks. So we'll make that better. Did you guys disagree with me? Okay, that's all right. The um, uh, targeted uh, reentry and the active component, we want to make it so that folks can move back and forth between the reserve and active component. Life work balance, another option there so that you can have a longer career. And if you need to get off the treadmill, to, you know, start a family, raise a family for a while. But if you want to get back on and pursue those objectives, you can get back in within days. We're doing that right now on the enlisted side. We took almost a thousand reservists back in and went back out to sea to help us fill some of those gaps at sea. And they're back on the track on the way as if they never uh, left. On the officer side, we've got some more obstacles, but we're, we're working those aggressively. Um, so, so tons of stuff like that. Ready development learning. This is uh, you know about breaking up the uh, careers worth of training that we give you at the at, at the beginning of, uh, of a sales career and giving the, the right training at the right time in your career. You all will start to benefit from that when you go back to sea because we're going to give you pieces of your rating training when you go back for your subsequent tours. But eventually, and we're just starting to roll out the first courses with modernized content delivery. So it's not, you're not going to go back to the training schoolhouses. We're going to bring the training to you wherever you are in the waterfront. And we're going to train it using, you know, advances in learning methods. So, you know, there'll be some stuff done by instructors, but some of it might be virtual reality. Some of it might be, uh, you know, other methods. Whatever helps you learn fastest and retain the information the best. And the science of learning has has progressed a lot. People don't learn by PowerPoints or you know listening to, to people lecture. People learn 
differently, different people learn differently. And we're going to apply all those tools and help you learn better. And we're going to bring the training to you. And eventually, it'll be out on ships as well. And that'll also help with rating modernization so that you can even cross rate. And rating modernization won't just be a one way street. You might be able to move back and forth depending on what rates you're qualified in. And because it's there, local at the waterfront, you can do it very quickly and play for our rating modernization or a cross rate on detailing marketplace. That's another thing you'd be able to play for. So it could be a rating change and an advancement all in one on detailing marketplace. So a lot of that stuff's common. Career readiness, you know, uh, the uh, culture of, uh, of health, inclusion and diversity. We have some workshops on that. You know, a lot of um, studies out there that say inclusive teams perform better. Um, we know that's true when we're talking about warfare as well. Uh, when we think about inclusion in, in, in terms of diversity, but it also applies in terms of diversity of ideas, the way people think about the problem that you're trying to solve, the solution, the way you look at it, the way you're looking at the adversary, and how the adversary is looking at you. But we've always been talking about it in terms of, you know, bringing people into the Navy and retaining them. That's really, really important because if we don't have people on our teams that can help us look at those solution sets that are diverse, we're going to have blind spots and we're not going to get the best solutions to those battle problems. And we have to train our leaders on how to build inclusive teams to get those best solutions or we're not going to, we're not going to win in our war fighting mission. So we've been putting a lot of uh, effort into our leader development programs, including the new enlisted leader development program. And I encourage you to talk to Mick Pond and Fleet Poshoffer, both of those guys were, you know, the architects of that uh, university leader development program. Talk to them about what that means to you. Culture fitness, we should talk about that. Uh, a lot of stuff about the Navy becoming a family-friendly service. We have to be. It's an operation <coughs> imperative. Truly believe that. We've just begun work there. Things like child care improvements that we're working on. Um, child uh, development center uh, capacity and hours, uh, the career intermission program that lets sailors take a, up to a three years sabbatical to go out and start a family. We have a lot of sailors doing other things with that. That's good too. We should talk about that. So lots of stuff to talk about under Sailor 2025. I'd love to hit those in some of our uh, other sessions today. Next slide. And then to make all this stuff better and help towards that customer service, uh, ideal that we have set for ourselves to treat you the way you deserve to be treated. We're bringing this to you with uh, a new operating model. And the operating model we really think you deserve is the convenience of what you get with your modern online banking or insurance. I mean, how many people have NFCU or USAA? You know, you, you never go to USAA in San Antonio, Texas, right? You do it on your, your app or on the phone. And that's the way we want you to do business with your paid personnel uh, from this point forward. So um, my Navy Career Center opened in September. That was a very limited release. And we, we uh, opened that call center 24-7. And we said they were going to do this much by the end of the first week. They were answering questions on about five times as many things as we said they were going to be able to do, and they were doing pretty well at it. How many people here have called my name Career Center? Yeah, not that many. We'll put out the number, but they're, they're doing pretty well in answering questions, and right now they're still operating on our old 1960s museum-ready systems. Uh, by this time next year, they're going to have you know AI-driven customer service uh, support to be able to do it even better for you. So it's going to get better and better uh, when they help you. Uh, it'll be like calling USAA type thing. The the um, My Navy portal is still very clunky today. When you go on My Navy portal, 
you got to log in because it reroutes you to uh, one of our 255 pieces of crap systems out there. Uh, you know, 1960s vintage things. You got to have you know the 18 character passwords with profanity in them, and all sorts of other stuff. Or otherwise, it won't work. So. If you notice, though, day by day, those cross-links are going away because we've been unplugging those old systems as our new system comes online and takes over more and more functions. That new system uh, went online uh, August of 2017 and started taking over uh, service records and new sailors coming in at Great Lakes. Uh, and as it takes on more and more functions, we're shutting those old systems down. By this time next year, most everything in your paying personnel record will be on that new system. So when you do a travel claim, instead of having to get fat fingered into five different databases at five different geographic locations across the country like it does today, your travel claim will be done electronically right the first time and in about two days. Imagine that. Another Navy tradition of having your pay screwed up for four months after every move gone. That's one we probably won't miss. That app that we just released um, uh, right after New Year's, My Navy Record, not really too impressive in terms of what you can do with it, but it, it's pretty fast that you are really accessing your personnel record and you're doing it without a CAC card. If you haven't downloaded it, get it, because everything else that we're going to do to your entire personnel set of business is going to use that tactless technology. So if you get set up on that, the updates that come on that are going to build, you know, and they're going to start coming fast and furious. And eventually, even your PCS move, you know, will come via that app. You'll get your orders, which will be, you know, a couple of lines, go here on this date. All that gobble good uh, accounting stuff will be in the background. The computer needs to that, not you. Um, it'll be simple, you can read it, and uh, you'll get a notification like an Amazon delivery that says, hey, knucklehead, it's time to check out. When you check out, a little QR code of your airline boarding pass will come out, come up, and you'll get it scanned, and you'll check out, and that's, that's going to be your checkout. I'll check you out of everything. And then um, if you want to apply for government housing or child care at your next duty station, you'll be able to do that from the app. Um, you'll, you'll be able to search things about the location you're going to uh, from the app, uh, communicate with your sponsor, things like that. When you go to intermediate duty stations, it'll remind you to scan in your receipts, it'll upload them, it'll be working with travel in the, in the background, and then you'll scan in again when you, when you uh, arrive, and it'll be your travel claim for you. So, all the pain in the ass things that we've come to know and love uh, will go away, and hopefully you'll you know, not miss that stuff. And you also won't miss PSDs, I think. Um, and the PSs are not going away. We're, we're growing that rate, uh, personal men and men, because they're the ones running this stuff in the background. Uh, we're, con we're not going to rely on, on contractors to do this. We want sailors taking care of sailors, another lesson learned from some of the other uh, things that, that happened in the past. So, a lot of goodness coming out of this. We talked about radio relevant learning, we talked about detailing marketplace, culture, fitness, you know, we are stopping on the uniform changes for the next several years. <laughs> Let everything settle down. Except for one, you do the build. Get rid of the uh, minion PT gear. <laughs> Can you do the build, please? <laughs> On the slide, there you go. So that's our new PT here. It's optional right now, but uh, it is going to become mandatory at some point. It's actual running material and actual running shorts. So the non-shape uh, <laughs> no uh, no pockets. I'm convinced the master chiefs that were on the uniform board did not put them in here, so sailors will be tempted to put their hands in their pockets so they can yell at them. My name and crew center we talked about, and then as I said, we're Going to this whole host of um, app-driven things, you know, one-stop shopping on my name portal, so you don't have to be an expert on all these instructions and find stuff. You know, the uniform app now has all the uniforms on it. Um, uh, 
uh, the um, uh, parenting and uh, pregnancy and parenting uh, app. The, uh, we're building a spouse app for, you know, if you're new to the Navy, here's how, here's how things work, here's where you can find things. Uh, the uh, uh, certification opportunities online, here's how your experience in the Navy translates to uh, certifications uh, in the civilian world. So tons of stuff. All those apps will be on I need before it'll also be in the App Store, uh, both uh, Apple and uh, Android. So you know, that's how we're going to do business. And we're not just going to do the personnel ones. We're going to try and bring you know, most of the, the need apps into the I need before so it kind of becomes your one-stop shopping place. And hopefully it becomes simpler, more intuitive. Those apps are getting better. They're not where we want them to be at. Some of them are pretty PowerPoint looking, which is unsatisfying. So uh, as fast as we can uh, improve those, we will. Next. And uh, that's really kind of my last punchline. The technology, the 1960s, the processes behind them, some of them are as old as the you know, forming the United States Navy in 1793. Um, and we're picking those things apart. So when we started this thing, it was you know, things like, uh, you know, resignations and retirements. Uh, 53 staff took us 13 months. Uh, the team has gotten those things down to, you know, 13 steps in 10 days. With no IT, no changes in IT, just because they got rid of the redundancies and the unnecessary, no value added steps. So as soon as we bring the new IT, it's gonna be even faster. When you put in one of those requests, you know, today you're putting in an electronic version of a 1306 on my EV portal, and you're, you're able to track it through the routing system. It's still taking, you know, on average 14 days. Well, when we're done with the new system, it's going to be, you know, pretty instantaneous that you're going to get an answer back. So that's the way it's going. Customer service, um, you go see where it is, who's looked at it comments back, have a dialogue. Uh, but I still think, at the end of the day, the best opportunity is to be able to talk to people, have an interaction. Um, when we do these career development symposium uh, events, um, probably the most rewarding event for me is going and watching the junior sailors talk with the community managers, uh, the pack sailors getting rated. You know, when we're trying to have a conversation about a career impacting the citizen, like what, you know, what uh, branch am I going to go into as a pack sailor? And you look at CMS ID, and it just says these are these three areas I can go into, and this is, these are the requirements, and this is the date. But when you talk to a human being, it says, well, this is the likelihood of this being open on this date, but I could give you this, this, or this now today. Would you take this, and this is what this means, that's a different conversation. The machine can't do that. So, and, and, go, and then go talk to your chief about that. Or go talk to the chief in that division and come back and see me in a couple hours. You know, no substitute for people and leadership and mentoring. So, come on out and see us uh, later on today. One last slide here, and that is a ton of references. Unfortunately, all our websites are still all over the map. We, we got to fix that, but there's a, you know, an NPC website, there's a CNP uh, YouTube channel that's got this stuff, a Facebook page, but you know, the NPC website is still probably the best uh, one stop uh, shopping. We'll get all this stuff out. Um, there's some really good um, recruiting video stuff that you ought to look at with our um, Forged by the Sea advertising campaign. These faces of the fleet videos that are on Navy.com, not Navy.no, but Navy.com, are awesome. They're real sailor stories that, you know, sailors have been bringing their stories to us. Pretty awesome stories from your ship tanks uh, that, you know, what the Navy meant to them and why they joined and why they stay in. And uh, some other videos up there on the YouTube channel about where we're going with the personnel system too. Give them a look if you're interested. Thanks for your time this morning. Look forward to talking more. Uh, we've got lots of material put out, lots of questions.